Good morning. Can anybody tell me what corporate worship is? Anybody have? Gathering. Go ahead. The body gathering together to worship. Yeah. The body gathering together to worship. Any other thoughts? The thing about worship is that you can never enter it as a group. You can only enter it as an individual. Now the individuals may comprise a group, and that would be corporate worship. But when it comes right down to it, um, just like the song they were singing, it is just you and God. And and you know, oftentimes being in a corporate setting uh, can make it more difficult to worship because you're aware of people around you. And you're not as focused on that intimacy with you and God because there's stuff happening. I think God intended that. I think God desired that so that in even the little things, we would have to work through to worship Him. Because He's, he's the pearl of great price. He's worth everything that we have. And, and in that parable, it says that the farmer went and sold everything that he had gladly. That he might obtain that pearl of great price. And so when we come together as a church, um, I, I apologize to those of you that stand near me. Because I don't have all the words memorized. And when I close my eyes, I just sing whatever comes into my head. And oftentimes it has nothing to do with the song up front. But I want to encourage you, develop intimacy with God in corporate worship. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Don't worry about what other people might think. Work on that time where you can come and worship the Almighty. That you can just lay all your cares at His feet. That you can embrace who He is. That you can give praise for all that He's done. And let all of this around <coughs> fade off. And then you'll find an incredible thing happening. You'll find a chorus of millions singing in praise to an audience of one. And it's glorious. I had the privilege to be with some 30,000 men back in the early 90s at Promise Keepers in Denver. And they had, they had dynamic worship. It was very good. It was very easy to enter into worship. But we're sitting at Mile High Stadium. And that was a little distracting to me. It was big. And we got to a point in the song where I knew that my focus had been off because I'm, I'm just standing there looking at all these men singing praise. And I just, I, I kind of had to turn my shoulder to what was going on and just bow my head and, and God opened my ears to hear the worship of thousands of men singing praise to the Almighty God. And I think He allowed me just a little tiny glimpse, a little taste of what it's going to be like in heaven as all of the servants of God, human and angelic, gather together and answer the phone. <laughs> that wasn't where I was going <laughs> and they sing praises and they sing worship and you know I honestly believe there are going to be no tone deaf people in heaven because God in his majesty and his grandeur is going to take all those different sounds and he's going to weave them into a glorious tapestry and it's going to be incredible it's going to be awesome. So start practicing today. Even, even today, start practicing. Start singing worship to Him. Don't be distracted by what's going on around you. Um, one of the things that I always picture when Trevor and Brittany lived down the road, Trevor would put on his headphones when he was mowing, and he would sing loud. <laughs> and, and, you know, 
I, I don't know what particular songs he was listening to. I was not familiar with them. But he was out there singing and worshiping as he was mowing his lawn. And I believe that if we allow worship to permeate everything that we do, uh, one of the, the visions that I had, a picture that I had when I was praying for my grandchildren is Isla. And I, I pictured her um, as a young adult, uh, maybe in her late teens, and I, I pictured her vacuuming. And it was, uh, uh, she just doing mundane chores. She's vacuuming, but she was singing as she was vacuuming. And she was singing praise. I, I didn't hear what she was singing. I didn't hear whether it sounded pretty or not, but that picture is in my head and I pray that over her. I pray that she will become a worshiper and, and that worship will not just be on the gathering on Sunday, but it'll be a, a lifestyle, a choice of living where she would just worship in everything that she does, even when she vacuums. And I want to encourage you in that today. Make worship a lifestyle so that when you come in the door, we, we watched a a video on Thursday at the brothers meeting Louis Giglio was talking about worship uh, if you have an opportunity I would encourage you go look it up on YouTube watch it it's about an hour long uh, but one of the things that he talked about uh, was that you you have to come through the door the door being Jesus Christ in order to be prepared so when you come through the doors at church you're prepared to worship and and if you haven't come through the door of Jesus Christ then you come into church and you're not prepared and, and there's other things going on and, and it takes sometimes several songs or maybe all the songs to get your heart and your mind into that place where you can have intimacy with God. But if we prepare that in the morning, as we're going through our day, as we're getting dressed, as we're, we're brushing our teeth, as we're eating our breakfast, whatever it is, whatever your Sunday morning routine is, if you're worshiping by the time you come in that door, there is already a spirit of worship in this room. And it doesn't matter how many times so-and-so has to get up and use the restroom. And it doesn't matter if somebody's got something going on and they're, they're talking a couple rows in front of you. None, none of that stuff matters because you're already there in intimacy with the Father. And then corporate worship, all of the individuals worshiping together as a group begins to flow and blend and become this beautiful tapestry before God. So I would just encourage you today, make worship a lifestyle. Amen? Yeah. Amen. I use amen to let you know I'm, I'm taking a break. <coughs> <coughs> if you have your Bibles, open to, somebody tell me? Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, thank you. Actually, we start in chapter 5 to lay the groundwork for what we're reading in, in chapter 6. Um, this is the last week that we're going to be spending on the doctrine of baptism. Um, we have been working through what the writer of Hebrews calls the elementary doctrines of the faith. The, 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 you know, when you go to elementary school, what, what are you going to elementary school? So you can learn the basics. You know, you got to learn ABCs before you can read. You, you've got to learn to add before you can multiply. Um, you know, there's, there's a discipline that takes place so that you learn how to study. You're learning the basics so that you can move on to greater things. And so we see the writer of Hebrews. He's writing to the Hebrew Christians. And he's talking about Jesus being the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. And, and this is huge. We don't understand because we've never lived under the Levitical priesthood. Okay, We've never been a part of that promise when God called uh, the Levites out, specifically the Aaron and, and his descendants, to be the priests and the caretakers of, of his tabernacle and then his temple. And, and so we, we weren't really ever a part of that. So when we read that, we go, yeah, okay. But to the Hebrews, this is huge. Because what he is telling them is that Jesus is greater than Aaron. And that's, that's huge because Aaron is who the priesthood comes through. This is the, that branch that mediates between man and God to, to intercede and, and offer the sacrifices. And, and now he's saying there's one that's come that's even greater. But then he, he has to pause and he says, well, unfortunately you're not ready for this. 
And, and that, to me, if I were a, a Hebrew receiving this letter, that would be almost insulting. Because he's saying you're, you're still children. You've not grown up. You've not matured. You've not developed to the point where you can have more. So we're going to start reading in chapter 5. I'll read through it real quick. And, and we'll get into baptism. Uh, so starting in verse 11, referring to Jesus, the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. He says, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain. Not because the topic is necessarily difficult, but because you have become dull of hearing. I think that's a caution for all of us right there. I remember when I was going through my crisis in, in faith. And I would attend church because it was an obligation, not because I wanted to be there. And I was mad at, at the church. I was mad at God. I felt like um, none of it was working the way that I saw that it should work in Scripture. And I was, I was just frustrated. And I came into church and I would, I would critique you can translate that as criticize the pastor's message. And I would make notes. I would have pages of notes of things that, you know, he's, well, that's, that's not actually how that translation should be interpreted. That's, you know, and I would, oh, he, he really should have followed up on this. Why did he spend so much time on this rabbit trail? What a waste of time. Do you think I was dull of hearing? I, I think I was hard of hearing. I, I don't think I could hear. I was so wrapped up in my own self-righteousness that I couldn't receive any of the words that the pastor was saying. And, and it took a number of years for God to break me of that. To be able to listen to the message, not to criticize, not to critique, but to receive from God what God would give me. And that's an ugly, bad place to be when you're hard of hearing. It's a dangerous place to be. Because I felt like, well, these guys can't teach me anything. I've already got it. I have a, an older brother, my oldest brother, who uh, was a pastor for a time and is now an evangelist. Um, one of the things that he shared with me that he struggles with when, when, he, st when he starts to kind of get away from God, when he falls into the rut and, and there's no newness to it, is... He, he gets frustrated with pastors because he, he, you know, the idea is, well, I could have preached that message better than them. And, and then he's right in the place that I was. Uh, you can't hear, you can't receive, and, and you can't grow without receiving. I mean, what plant grows that it can't receive water? You know, they, they all wither and die. So this is not, this is a hard thing for him to tell him that you're dull of hearing. And be on your guard against being dull of hearing. Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. I just want to say something right there about that to distinguish good from evil scripture tells us that in the, the last days things are going to get ugly they're going to get bad scripture also tells us that if it were possible even the elect would be deceived we have got to be sharp discerners of truth because the enemy is going to come at us and, and we always think that he's going to come and oppose us uh, almost in a violent type nature. It's going to be something that's so obvious that, that we're just going to have to stand and resist. But we also got to remember that, uh, you know, Scripture says that he's a lion walking around looking for someone to devour, but also says he's an angel of light. And he likes to insinuate himself into the church. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, the devil quoted Scripture. And if Jesus were not sharp with the Word of God and knowledgeable of the Word of God, he could have looked at that and gone, oh yeah, that's a scriptural principle. But Jesus stood firm on what he knew to be true and answered Scripture with Scripture. And that's where we need to be. We need to be sharp discerners of the truth. So, chapter 6, verse 1. 
Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ. Therefore, because you're children, you need to mature. So because you need to mature, let us leave the elementary doctrines. Let's move on beyond the basics. Let's get into the meat and potatoes instead of the milk. I like meat and potatoes. I'm not real big on milk. But our kids were. There was a time when we would go through 8 to 10 gallons of milk a week. They ate it on their cereals. They, they poured big cups of it and chugged it down. And I'm looking at it like the gas meter as it's going up in the bucket of gas. <laughs> 10 cents, 15 cents, 30 cents, oh my gosh. You just drank down $1.50 of milk, dude. Go mow my lawn. So let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead, work, dead works and of faith towards God and of instructions about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now, because God has written in His Word that we should move on, do you suppose that God permits? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think this is a question of, well, if God lets you, you will move on. I think it's God's heart and desire for us to move on. Otherwise, this passage wouldn't be in here. Okay? So this is almost a rhetorical statement here. Saying, uh, well, if God permits, of course He permits, because I'm telling you now, this is what God wants you to do. Okay? So we've talked about um, repentance from dead works. We've talked about faith toward God. We're talking about instructions about washings. Uh, in some of yours, it may say um, baptisms. Uh, there's a couple other ways this is rendered. The word, the two Greek words used here are baptismos, didache, and that's baptism teachings. Okay? So... What is baptism? Well, we spent the first week on this, and we, we went through, we looked at the Old Testament, and we looked at what God had commanded of the people, His people, to, to cleanse themselves. And, and we went through a, a pretty exhaustive list of the things that they had to immerse themselves, to wash themselves, to be considered pure of. And, and, and in some cases, this was an ongoing, daily event, and in other cases, it would be infrequent, depending on a particular set of circumstances that happened. But, but over and over again in the law, in the Torah, God tells the people that you need to cleanse yourselves. And, and out of this teaching um, came this, this idea, we see by the time the New Testament comes, we see this idea of baptism, where uh, we, we looked at the mikvahs. The, anybody remember the mikvahs, the, the tubs, the great big basins where the people would walk down into the living water and cleanse themselves and then walk out and they, they would go down on one side as unclean and they would come up on the other side as clean. And, and, but then by the New Testament time we see there's this, this kind of <coughs> new thought to this and it's coming out in the baptism of John. Now John being the, the forerunner, the crier, if you will, of Jesus Christ. Remember the town crier? Uh, he would come to the center of the town and he would cry out in a loud voice and then he would proclaim whatever the governor, the, the king, whatever royalty, whatever message was necessary so that the people would know what the will of the government was. Okay, now John is coming before Jesus as a proclaimer, as a crier, telling everybody, make straight the way because he's coming. And he, he's telling them, I'm not him because there is one coming after me that is greater than me. Okay? Now, keep in mind that John is considered by the people to be a prophet. Now, we don't have a lot of men that, that scripturally, from Malachi to Matthew, that, that fell under the category as being a prophet, at least not a prophet whose words were worthy of recording. Okay, so when John comes in, they're, they're looking at him as the voice of God. And he's teaching a baptism, but what is his baptism for? Or better yet, what is his baptism of? Repentance. 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 We, we talked about that. Uh, a, a turning of your thinking and then a reflection that's reflected in a turning of your life. Okay? But there's, there's one thing about John's baptism that we don't really look at 
Because baptism was a symbol of the sacrifice that were going on in the temple. Because in order to be cleansed of your sin, you had to sacrifice an animal, right? So just saying something and dipping in the water didn't necessarily make you clean because there had to be the sacrifice of blood. But the one time a year when they would do the, the great sacrifice for all the sins that Israel had committed unknowingly, and the high priest would go into the holiest place, the most holy place, and, and sprinkle blood on the altar and intercede for the people of Israel. Okay? But, but as a person, you live with sin on a daily basis. And when you read the law and all of the things that God looked at and said, this is not holy. This will make you unrighteous. I can't imagine there's enough animals in the world for sacrifice. I, I really can't. But John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Now, it wasn't unto repentance. It was because of repentance. Okay? He, he didn't say, well, if you're, in, in order to repent, you've got to go in the water. He said, no, you go in the water because you've repented. Okay? Because if somebody was not repenting, and he dumped them in the water, guess what? They just got wet. It had no meaning. They had to repent first. As a matter of fact, in, in one of the Gospels it says, they confessed their sins as a part of the repentance before they were baptized. Can you imagine what our baptisms would look like if people actually confessed their sins? I, I think we'd be out there throwing soap at them. <laughs> okay? But John is telling them that, that you need to repent. Why do they need to repent? Because he's preparing the way for Jesus to come. Okay? Now, when Jesus came to John, does it ever strike anyone as odd that Jesus would get baptized? I mean, John is preaching a baptism of repentance. Scripture tells us Jesus knew no sin. So why was Jesus baptized? I believe, honestly, John was baptized that the world would see that he was human. Not because he was sinful, but because he was bridging the gap between sinful man and a holy God. He was going to be the one that took the one and made a way for them to come to the other. Okay? Because he said that all righteousness might be fulfilled. Well, Jesus was already righteous. So it wasn't his righteousness that needed to be fulfilled. There was some other measure. I think it was the righteousness of all men. So let's uh, look here a little bit. Oh, my notes are on the floor. Just got a few things that I want to say about baptism. Because when Jesus entered into his ministry... He also baptized. But his baptism was different than John's. And we know that because in the book of Acts, as, as the apostles are going out, we find several instances where Paul, or in another case, um, um, Aquila and Priscilla, they, they come across someone that has a form of relationship, but they don't have the fullness of the cross. We see a lot of those people today. They have a form of relationship, a form of godliness. What does the scripture say? Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. What is the power of, of the cross? It's to make us righteous, to make us holy. To restore a right relationship to God. To reconcile us to Him. And if you are, are struggling with this idea that, that you're not good enough, first, you're right. You're not good enough. None of us are good enough. That was the whole reason for Jesus' coming. Because none of us could ever be good enough. So, so let that truth sit there, but understand that there's a greater truth. Because when you come to the cross, when you come, you come to die. We're going to talk about this in a moment because it's significant in why we baptize today. But when you are resurrected into newness of life, you are resurrected into the very righteousness of God. 
And for you to say, I'm not good enough at that point, is to call God a liar. Because God has said, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that you are. You are righteous. You are righteous. You are the very righteousness of God. Okay? So don't let the devil trip you up. Acknowledge that there is a truth there. Yeah, you're right. I'm not good enough. Thank God because all the glory goes to Him. Because if I was good enough, I'd be patting myself on the back. <clears throat> patting myself on the back right into hell. But when you come to the cross and you're resurrected into newness of life, it's all because of His grace. Okay? So, <clears throat> Jesus' baptism, while there is the, the call to repentance, it's, it's a little bit more than just repentance. As a matter of fact, uh, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. We're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of time there because we see John's baptism in the, in the Gospels and we hear about it a little bit in Acts. Um, there is a young man named Apollos who was a convert and when he came to saving faith, the dude was on fire. And he's going out and he's telling everybody about this faith, this, this saving faith that he has come across. But he, he's not doing it with the full understanding because the baptism that he has received is the baptism of John, which is for the repentance of sin. And, and then there's this couple, Priscilla and Aquila, or Aquila, that hear his message and they say, well, let's, let's talk about this a little bit because you have a part of the story. But you don't have the whole picture. You don't have all of it. So they, they sit down with him and they begin to teach. And we know that Apollos grew in that because we know when, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he says, you know, some of you say that I belong to Paul and some say that I belong to Apollos. So we know that Apollos was out there preaching the word. Okay, So he's out there sharing. But... When he meets with Aquila and Priscilla, he, he gets the full measure of truth. So in Jesus' baptism, it, there is the, the call to repentance. But there's a little bit more that goes along with it. Because uh, Romans chapter 6, let's, let's read the passage here real quick. Let me catch up to my notes. Okay, I'm going to back up again. Um, Paul is writing to the Romans. We're getting into the, the meat of, of this book. But he's talking about the grace, the grace that is extended to us. Um, I'm going to back up to verse 19. Actually, I'll go to 18 of chapter 5. It says, uh, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, the trespass being the sin of Adam, and that condemned all men because all men come from Adam. And the men, by the way, women, that's just not the gender male. That's mankind. So you're stuck here too with us. Okay? Um, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. And again, women, that's mankind. So you're, you're saved and, and redeemed the same way that we are. Okay? For as by the one man's dis disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now I want to talk a little bit about this verse before we, we move on says, the law came in to increase the trespass. That doesn't mean that the law gave birth to sin. Okay? It means that the law made us aware of sin. Because, like Paul says, if, if I hadn't known what it was to covet, how could I covet? 
If, if nobody told me that that was a sin, why would I think it was a sin? Why would I think that it's wrong? Okay? So he's not saying that, that the law brought in sin or that in some way the law gave birth to sin, but he's saying the law makes us aware of our sin and, and how far removed from God we are. Okay? Um, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, and I thank God for this phrase right here, grace abounded all the more. Now this is not a challenge, but you cannot out God's grace. It's another thing that the devil likes to trap us in. Oh, you blew it again. <laughs> you know, Jesus said it was only 70 times 7. You're well past 490. <laughs> Your feet are getting hot. Hell's getting close. No, God's grace exceeds our sin. If His grace could not exceed our sin, there would be no purpose in the cross. Okay? So, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, verse, or chapter 6, verse 1. This is one of those, those key scriptures that we need to keep in our mind. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Okay? Because the logic of man, which actually is not logic, it's, it's corrupt, is that, well, I mean, if, if God's grace exceeds my sin, then wouldn't it be more worthy of me to sin more that I might receive more grace? Next verse. By no means... Does anybody else have a different rendering there? Different translation? By no means, what, what do you have? God forbid. God forbid. Anyone else? May May forbid. Forbid. Whoa, that was just a whole jumble. What? Was that last one? May, May it never be. be. Absolutely not. You, you can't get more emphatic in the Greek, folks. Absolutely not. Okay? How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? This is key right here. Okay? This is important that we grasp this, that we understand this and we hold on to it. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Okay, now... John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. You, you repented of your sins and you washed as, as the symbol of repenting from your sins. But Jesus' baptism goes so much deeper than that. Because Jesus' baptism, when you come, you come to die. You come to die. So that all that you are is relinquished, is released, is given up for God to do with as He wills. Now, if we leave it with this understanding, we kind of go, oh. But He says more. Verse 4. We have been buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, God doesn't just put us in the ground. He doesn't just put us in the water and leave us there. He brings us up. He resurrects us into a newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Now, let's look at this idea of death for a minute. <clears throat> let's say we were put on trial for our sin. And we were given a life sentence. When would that sentence be over? When we died. When we died. It's something I don't understand in American jurisprudence. 
How can somebody get consecutive life sentences? <laughs> well, when you're dead, you're dead. Everything's paid. The law does not apply to dead men. You can no longer be held accountable for what you did when you die. So when we go under in baptism, that is us identifying with Christ when they buried Him. We become as dead men. And then when we come up out of that water, we identify with the resurrection of Christ and for us, newness of life. We become something other than what we were. I don't like that the American, well, actually, it's, it's more than just the American church, but, but how we have minimized the significance of what baptism is. Um, so many people get baptized without having a, an understanding of what is going on here. You know, we, we like to say, well, you know, this is just the, the, the symbolic act that proves your salvation or as a result of your salvation. But it's so much more significant than that, so much more rich than that. Because what we are doing is we are identifying ourselves with Christ. We are saying that we are no longer a part of this group. But through death and resurrection, we now belong to Him. A newness of life. John's baptism could not take away sin. Jesus' baptism is because our sin has been taken away. It's because the work has already been done. It's because the grace that has been extended to us has been received by faith. And we walk... Right... This gives new meaning to the passage later where, where Paul says, Oh, that I may know Him. Not only in the resurrection, but also in His suffering. In His suffering. Because Scripture says, He who is dead is done with sin. And if we really believed, if we would get down in our hearts, that when we came to the cross, we died. And we were resurrected as new life. The suffering would have no fear for us. No fear for us. Because Jesus has said, I've done all the work. All you have to do is follow me. We go, well, you know, life is difficult. Yeah. He didn't say life would not be difficult. He said he would be there with you. He said he would give you everything you need to get through it. Now, we, we have difficulties here. Over in Syria, they have other difficulties. Over in North Korea, they have other difficulties. Uh, I, I pray that we don't have to go through their difficulties, but sometimes I wonder if maybe we should. That we might really see the steadfast devotion of a true believer. I mean, we have people that stop going to church because they get offended by something the pastor said. How would they ever face torture? How would they ever face imprisonment? How would they ever face separation from their families? How would they ever face death? How would we ever face death? Because I was there. I left church because I was offended. God brought me back. He corrected my thinking. He helped me to uh, humble part of myself. I, I still have areas that it, it amazes me. The areas that I still have pride. I thank God he didn't show it to me all at once because I'd have just deflated. I'd been like a balloon. And there would have been nothing left. So Jesus' baptism is identifying ourselves with him who was dead, who was buried, who was resurrected again as we shall be pending. He does not come. Every one of us is going to die. Every one of us will be disposed of in some way and every one of us will be resurrected again. This baptism is important because it tells everyone whose we are. Now when I came back up out of the water when I was baptized, I was still Glenn. 
I was still the person in identity, in thinking, that went into the water. The change didn't come when I went in the water. The change came when I said, I do, I will, I accept. That's when the change comes in. This is why I absolutely believe that when Peter is writing, or he's speaking, I'm sorry, in the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 2, and he tells them, they say, what, what must we do to be saved? He says, repent and be baptized. I don't think that he's saying baptism will go unto salvation. I, I believe that he's saying baptism is because of salvation. Because if the baptism was for repentance and, and unto salvation, how many times would we have to get baptized? Every time we stumbled, every time we sinned. We'd have to go back in the water. It'd be a never-ending line of dunkings. Just like the sacrifice had to be performed year after year after year after year. But Jesus made it such that when we go into the water and we come out, it, it, it's not because of the water. It's because of what He's done. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. The body of sin, that, that, that idea, the picture there is all that sin is. It's, it's all of sin. If you were to put it into one place, that's the body of sin. So there's, there's not any sin in here that, 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 you know, well, I did something really bad when I was a kid or when I was younger. or You know, my, my grandfather, uh, my grandfather went to church every Sunday. He was one of the leaders at the Lutheran church uh, that he and my grandmother attended. Um, my grandfather got cancer, and we knew he was not saved. He, he went to church because it was expected, it was obligated. Um, he went to church because I think Grandma would have probably bitten him if he didn't. But he was not saved. And when he was in the hospital, he, he was essentially his deathbed. Um, my brother had the opportunity to go share with him and, and talk to him about salvation. And, and he told my brother, he said, I'm, I'm scared. Because he, he did not believe that God would forgive him some of the things that he had done. That's another lie of the devil, folks. So many people are caught up, well, well, you know, God will never forgive me this. The only thing that God will not forgive you is that you don't believe. And, and he can't forgive you that. So, my brother got to share the gospel with my grandfather. And a couple days later, he came back. He, it's one of those things that I hate in the church that we rush to salvation. You know, we paint this rosy picture of salvation and, and make it sound like, you know, you, you say these words, you pray this prayer, and, and life is never bad again. That, that, that's not true. Jesus actually tells us that we should consider the cost. That we should count it up. Okay? So when, when you share the gospel, you're giving them a lot to think about. A lot to ponder. And I, I believe a lot of people make a confession of faith out of an emotional moment. And they have no understanding what they're saying. And I, and I think that's why we have three quarters of the seed that was scattered produce no fruit. Okay? So, a couple days later, my brother went back and he talked to my grandfather again. And this time, he was able to lead my grandfather in prayer. And my grandfather gave his life over to the Lord. Now, I had seen my grandfather before he was saved as we were driving down to Oklahoma. And then I got to see him after he was saved when we were coming back from Oklahoma. This was a man at peace. Before, you could see the fear in his eyes. But after, there was peace. He knew that when he died, he was going home to the embrace of his father. That all that he had judged himself unworthy for, his father had forgiven. And that nothing would be held against him. That's the power of grace. That's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. So why do we baptize? Well, 
we talked last week, Jesus told us, go and baptize. Preach and baptize. We also talked briefly, he, he, he set us the example. Here was, here was Jesus coming up, probably around 30, and he came up to John with the baptism of repentance. I think it's amazing that when Jesus came up out of the water, we have one of our most discernible scriptures, discernible readings of the triune God. Because Jesus the Son came up out of the water, God the Father spoke from heaven, and God the Spirit came down as a dove. He didn't go under the water because he had sin. He, he went under water to be the bridge for us, to set the example for us. Remember, Jesus is, is the one that we follow. Not this man or that man, not this apostle, not that saint. We follow Jesus. Now, for a time, we may be under the leading of an, uh, an under-shepherd. We, we may follow a person, as Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay. That leaves it wide open because if Paul ever gets off, guess what? You don't follow him anymore. You, you, you don't follow him. You stop. Him. Okay. So baptism. This is one of those elementary foundational doctrines of our faith. We do it because we have been saved. If you have not been baptized, next week, after potluck, we're going down to Bell Crossing to have a baptism service. I would encourage you, come talk to me. If you have been baptized, we've had several people that came to me and asked to be baptized again. The scripture doesn't tell us how many times, it doesn't say once and you're done. Okay, there's nothing in scripture that says. I believe it's an attitude. When Christy and I went to Israel, uh, we were baptized in the Jordan. Not because I felt like we needed to get saved again. I wouldn't have gone to Israel if I hadn't been saved. I, I had no interest in going to Israel for the vast majority of my life. Then Dennis and Jeannie walked in. <laughs> and, and God used them and, and some other people to start stirring up in me a longing, a, a, a longing to go and walk where Jesus walked, to see the places that we read about. To, to see this was where God moved in such an incredible way. And, and over there, I mean, when we stood up on Mount Carmel and we looked out over the, the, the Valley of Jezreel, the, the plains of Armageddon, where Armageddon will take place, and, and they were pointing out, and, and okay, over there is Galilee, and, and over here is Nazareth, and, and over here is Mount Tabor, where, where Ruth, or uh, not Ruth, Deborah was, and, and, and over here, and, and, and they were just pointing out, and right, right around this area was where Elijah uh, sat and prayed, and, and down there was the Kishon River where he slaughtered the, the priests of Baal and Asherah, and, and, and to see all of this, and know that I'm standing in the midst of it, it was, was awesome. I, I, I regret in the moment, there was so much to take in, that I couldn't relish it. I couldn't fully appreciate it, because I, I was just like being overwhelmed. You know, on a hot day, it's very nice to get sprayed with water. But on a hot day when you're sitting in your chair and somebody comes up with a bucket of water and dumps it on your head, you don't appreciate it as much. Even though it's still refreshing, there's, there's this, this kind of otherness. And while I was in Israel, it was, I, I knew I was in the presence of something awe-inspiring, but I, uh, it was just overwhelming. I want to use that as a, as a footnote to you, man. If you want to go to Israel, start praying. Start praying. I want this church to be an Israel-going church. I want to be able to take people over there. There's something about that place that is unique that you don't find anywhere else in the world. And I, I absolutely believe because God declared it to be His very own. Okay? Being in the land of Israel, being in Jerusalem, it's just incredible. Okay? So, baptism. We do it because He directed us. We do it because he led by example. We don't do it under salvation. We do it because of salvation. Next Sunday, 
after uh, service, after potluck, we're going down to be baptized. I would encourage you, if you've not been baptized, or you want to do it again because you, you have a different understanding of what it is, come talk to me. If you've already been baptized, come down and support those that haven't. Come down and support those that are, are, are being baptized. Because you've been there. You can rejoice with them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we bless you this morning and we thank you. You are so good to us, Father. You're so generous to us. Your loving kindness knows no end, Father. Your mercies are new every morning. Your grace exceeds our sin. And Father, we can't help but be thankful. I ask, Father, that you would take your word, that you would root it in our hearts, that, Father, there it would find a good place to grow, and that, Father, it might bear much fruit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.